All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, it's my pleasure to be here to talk to you about the Endodontist, the Da Vinci of Denton. This is a lecture that was given at the AAE in Los Angeles in 2024. But if you couldn't join us then, we're certainly happy that you're here today. Before we get started, a few housekeeping items. First and foremost, the opinions and suggestions that are presented in this lecture are mine and mine alone. They are not representative of Sonendo um, or any recommendations the company itself would make. And then also, I am being compensated for my time as a speaker today. So, you know, when we talk about the endodontist being the Da Vinci of Denton, we have to absolutely start with this painting. The Mona Lisa is arguably the most famous painting in the world. It's certainly Da Vinci's uh, most well-known work of art. And yet few people realize that this is a painting that Da Vinci himself never actually viewed as finished. You see, Leonardo da Vinci was insanely meticulous, so much so that it came at a fault sometimes. But he was really obsessed with this idea of manipulating and capturing the true human form. And the Mona Lisa was no different um, in that he was really so obsessive with this that he started this painting in 1503 and actually carried it with him until his death in 1517. And locals would always say they would see da Vinci in the morgue at night, dissecting cadavers. He would look at how the muscles moved and the nerves innervated the face, and then he would go back and add these little fine details to the Mona Lisa. And what's so great about that is now we have this painting that has transcended time, again, because of his meticulous detail and attention to really capture the natural form as close as possible. And when I thought about that, it kind of got me thinking, you know, as modern day endodontists, we actually share a lot of the same, uh, same, uh, uh, traits that da Vinci had. Number one, you know, we're both anatomical enthusiasts. We're all incredibly detail oriented. We're curious, we're creative, we're, um, you know, structured and we like systems. And then also we're ever evolving in our craft. And while we may not be painting the Mona Lisa, um, we're definitely obsessed and we're obsessed with this idea of anatomy and basically trying to paint or replicate the internal structure of the teeth. In most of us, this obsession actually began when we first saw Hess's, you know, renderings or anatomical uh, drawings of the Pulp Denton complex. And this is why if you go on social media, we're all sharing these beautiful cases, we're liking, we're commenting, you know, we're really obsessed with this idea of the thrill of the fill. It's also why invariably if we pick up the JOE or the IEJ, our eye is always going to be drawn to the articles or the studies that deal with micro CTs. Again, because we're living in a clinical world. And so to see this anatomy preserved in its natural state, with a micro CT is one of those things that just invariably catches our attention. And yet the reality is while we're trying to maintain the natural anatomy of the teeth, there's really a big problem that we have to, to face. You know, as endodontists, we've advocated for some techniques and ideas that have really been detrimental to the teeth. And a lot of these ideas like straight line access, unroofing the pulp chamber, cervical flaring, radically tapered shapes, all of them are actually destroying the very thing that we're trying to preserve. And while these actions do result in the loss of coronal tooth structure, they result in indiscriminate removal of um, midroot dentin, and they actually block the intricate anatomy with accumulated hard tissue and debris within the tooth. But that's not the worst part. The worst part is we have to deal with this. And this is really the deleterious and catastrophic result sometimes of our actions to try to save the teeth with traditional endodontic therapy. And while, you know, the exact cause of vertical root fracture remains elusive, 
we don't know. Is it caused by an oversized access? Is it from over instrumentation of the root canal spaces? Is it loss of that cervical dentin? There is one thing that we certainly do know, and that's the fact that this almost never occurs in natural teeth. So if it's not occurring in natural teeth, then we kind of have to take a step back and realize that this is something that we're doing. So, you know, what do we do about this? How do we combat these ill effects that are occurring in the teeth as a result of traditional endodontic care? And, you know, to quote Steve Jobs, we have to think different. And that begins by asking a very important question. And that question is, what's my purpose? And if you look up the definition of the purpose of endodontics, it's pretty plain and simple. Our purpose is to eliminate and or prevent apical periodontitis. It doesn't matter how you get there. You can start with a six gates and go down to a five gates, four gates, three gates. You can radically shape that canal as long as you eliminated apical periodontitis and or prevented it for some, some short period of time. Congratulations, you were a success at what our mission is. But I think the reality is that we need to reimagine our purpose as endodontists. Our purpose isn't just to eliminate and prevent the presence of apical periodontitis, but really to do so in a minimally destructive manner that again, protects and preserves the function and form and the natural beauty of the tooth itself. And so to do that, I would propose that we kind of need to have some tenants that will guide us throughout this process. So let's pull up those tenants and go through them. So the very first tenet I would propose is that conservation of the natural form actually begins with the initial access and it's gonna continue apically. Number two, we should reduce indiscriminate removal of dentin from the root canal space. So that means less instrumentation. We should also seek to minimize or eliminate hard tissue debris being accumulated within the intricate anatomy of the tooth. We want to embrace technology that removes tissue and can help us to adequately disinfect the entire root canal space. And then we want to predictably capture the intricate anatomy with minimal force. And then finally, the last tenet is to continuously evolve to meet these desires. You know, sometimes as endodontists, we get stuck in our own mindset. And what we have to do is actually step back with a growth mindset sometime and reevaluate where we are in this process. And if there's a better way to help us do something, then we have to kind of question our own belief system and then lean into that better way because it's only going to make us better as specialists. And, you know, for me, I think the centerpiece of this whole uh, idea of dentin conservation is really this device here, man. That's the gentle wave system. And for me, this journey started back in 2012 when I first heard about Sonendo at the AAE. It continued in 2017 when we adopted this technology into our practice. And it's a device that has really changed my thought process. It's completely changed the way that I practice endodontics and how I look at trying to save and maintain teeth in a, a minimally disruptive manner that's better for our patients. And so to really understand what the gentle wave is, I do wanna take a moment, I wanna to talk to you about the mechanism of action because I feel like it's critical that we understand that before we move forward talking about dentin conservation. So what does this actually look like? Well. First, we have a treatment console, and within that console, we're going to have optimized and degassed fluids. So what does that mean? It means that the fluid that's being delivered to your handpiece is going to have all of the, the air removed. So it's degassed, and we can eliminate vapor lock, which is very important. And then the fluids have been um, optimized to a very specific concentration so that we're all treating teeth in the same manner at the perfect concentration. And then as this optimized treatment fluid 
comes through your procedure instrument, it's going to exit through a small nozzle. And that nozzle is actually going to create a jet stream. And as that fluid interacts with stagnant water or stagnant fluid within that handpiece, we're going to get shear force. And that shear force is going to create cavitation bubbles. So we know, you know, with cavitation bubbles, as they increase in size, they then collapse and implode on themselves. And when this occurs, this is happening millions of times and it's creating this massive cavitation cloud within the tooth. Well, as a result, this multisonic energy is actually being delivered through shock waves basically throughout the entire root canal system. And the beauty of this is it will break down pulp tissue, it's going to break down biofilm. It's going to help eliminate bacteria from the tooth. And while we have this incredible, you know, cavitation, multisonic energy going through the root canal system, we also need to have a method for this to be evacuated safely. And so if you look at that diagram, if you imagine, here's your, you know, impingement plate on the head of the handpiece. That fluid comes across, it's directed back through this concave um, sound bar. And then as it gets deflected over the orifice of the tooth, it's going to create vertical lift. And most of us know this as if we take our air water syringe and we blow it across our access opening, what happens? The fluid comes out of the tooth. So same principle with the gentle wave procedure. That flow over a cavity is going to induce vertical upward flow or negative apical pressure and remove all the debris, bacteria, and tissue from the tooth itself. And so if we're maintaining this idea that gentle wave is going to be the centerpiece of our whole process, then really we have three things that we have to decide on. Number one, how are you going to access teeth? How are you going to instrument those teeth? And then how are you going to obturate them? And, you know, for me, I tend to lean into this idea of conservative access. It doesn't mean that ninja access or trust access is bad. Um, it's just my comfort zone because with a comfort, with a conservative access, we're not going to hog out the coronal portion of the tooth. We're actually going to maintain the pulp horns. We're going to keep things relatively parallel or straight. Um, the one we do want to shy away from is that traditional access form. So things are divergent out toward the crown of the tooth because it really removes a lot of unnecessary tooth structure and especially dentin. And then from there, we're going to move into our instrumentation portion. And for me, really, these are the only three files that I use. You can see my sponge. Basically, I'm going to have a DC taper 1403, a DC taper 1704, and then I'm going to finish my cases with an endo sequence CM uh, 1504 or a 2004. And then once we get to the obturation side, again, things have changed here. We used to have this idea of bulk uh, gutta percha, minimal sealer. Now we've transitioned to this idea of bulk sealer, minimal gutta percha. And so for the majority of our cases, we're going to employ just a single cone and bioceramic technique. And then sometimes we have to think outside the box and go to techniques like the squirt obturation or system math method, method um, or a modified squirt technique. And we'll talk about those here shortly. So let's jump into some cases. And this first one is tooth number seven. You can see we've maintained a very conservative access here. This is almost a ninja style access versus the typical oval form that we would get um, with our typical lateral incisors. Uh, instrumentation technique is just what I talked about, the 1403, the 1704, ending with a 1504 file. We're using the multisonic energy of the gentle wave system to clean and disinfect the entire root canal system and then obturating this case with a bioceramic sealer in single cone. And of course, you can see that we've maintained and preserved the natural anatomy that's present from the severe calcification, but we've also captured the lateral anatomy in the coronal third um, of the root there. You can see two lateral canals exiting toward the distal. Excuse me. So let's look at two more cases, and these are very different, but they're treated in the same manner. So if you look at 
The case on the left, this is going to be tooth number three, again, a conservative access. We're using the same instrumentation technique, so the same three files that we talked about earlier. Now, one thing you're going to notice on this particular case is that the palatal root has extensive external resorption. So this is a big canal. Does that mean that I need to use a big file? No, absolutely not. We're still using the same sequence. The purpose of the file is really to create a fluid pathway or confirm a fluid pathway and then debulk the tissue from the canal space. And then when we get to the obturation side of that, basically we're going to fit a cone that naturally fits the canal size that's present, but we don't need to instrument or enlarge that space with another instrument. And then the other thing that I'll point out, this case was finished with the bioceramic sealer and single cone techniques. And if you look in the post-op CBCT, which is the lower right view, you'll actually see there was an MB2 captured here. I never instrumented that canal. Again, this is where the beauty, the multisonic energy of gentle wave system actually helps us to predictably clean, disinfect, and debride some of this complex anatomy that we as endodontists face and we're expected to deal with. The case are in the far right. This is tooth number 14. Again, treated exactly the same way, same files, conservative access, only three files, 1403, 1704, and then a 1504 to the apex. Again, using the gentle wave system to maximize that disinfection. And then these are single cone techniques um, to capture the anatomy within this case. And so if we can clean and disinfect the anatomy with uh, canal appropriate instrumentation, then we have to have a way that we can predictably capture that anatomy. And really this is the challenging aspect of our job at this point. So with this particular case, here's tooth number 14. Again, we treated everything the same as the, the previous teeth up to a 1504 for our maximum file size. I did bulk sealer and comb placement, and then this is what we see. So while I'm happy with that palatal canal, I'm not really happy with the two buccal spaces. So in this case, we're gonna do some outside of the box thinking. I pulled the cones and then employed a technique that was first described by John Stropko. This is called the system S or the squirt technique. And basically what we're doing is we're injecting thermoplasticized gutta percha into the canal and using that to really capture the complex anatomy. And when we use this technique, this is what we get. So a very different result. This is what I expect to see post gentle wave. And again, it's not that gentle wave hasn't effectively cleaned and disinfected that root canal space, is that we don't have the best way to capture that anatomy sometimes using a more traditional technique. And you can see the distal buckle, we've got a bifurcation. And then what you can't see on the traditional radiograph, but we can see on a post-op CBCT, if you look, the MB1 actually splits about mid root and then we have an MB2 canal that bifurcates in the, the apical third area. So again, we're using the gentle wave system and again, an outside the box kind of technique to really capture the anatomy that's present and also preserve that natural tooth form. And I don't want you to think that these principles only apply to teeth that have never had endodontic care. So this is a great example. A tooth number 18, it's a retreatment case. Patient came in um, with an acute apical abscess. She was swollen, very uncomfortable. You can see the previous dentist was pretty aggressive with their access. So in this case, I can do a more traditional size access to help me remove the previous obturation material. And that's our goal. We just wanna remove what was placed before. We don't need to hog this tooth out. And then we're gonna use the multisonic energy and the negative apical pressure to help us clean and disinfect this really complex anatomy. You can see internal resorption, perforating external resorption, and we have this C-shaped anatomy to the tooth. And then ultimately this case is obturated just using bulk sealer and single cone technique. And again, you can see a very beautiful result for the patient. 
So, uh, you know, a few more cases here. Um, I said that I use basically three files for the majority of my, my cases. Um, this is, that's just kind of a guideline, but the reality is sometimes we don't need three files and both of these teeth were treated with a single file. So both of these, again, relatively conservative access. We're keeping things pretty parallel. If you look, the pulp horns are intact in both of these teeth. And this had one file taken to working length, and that's a 1704. And then again, because we're using advanced irrigation techniques and the power and the energy that uh, General Wave provides, we can predictably disinfect this complex anatomy. And if you look at the case on the left, which is tooth number 18, the off angle, you're gonna see basically the mesial canals merge into one space. Um, and then we have a nice fin in between them. If you look at the case on the right, this is a vital tooth that when it was treated and you can see this really beautiful, I mean, very complex anatomy within the mesial roots there. And again, this is a single file. A 1704. So we have to embrace this idea sometimes that less is more and that by instrumenting less, we're actually going to be able to capture and preserve that anatomy that we're all so keen to maintain. The reality is that this is hard to do. Um, and, you know, it's an ever evolving process. The As you're going down this path, you know, it's really kind of a balancing act. So what I don't want people to do is to, you know, try to embrace gentle wave and go down this path and then become frustrated because they're trying to adhere to all of these things at one time. It's okay if you have a case sometimes where maybe you need to make your access a little larger. Um, it's okay if maybe you need to instrument just a little bit larger in some cases in order to obturate. But our goal should really be that we're trying to do as little as possible and preserve that initial anatomy that was present in the tooth before we ever access or before we ever introduce a file into the canal. And the reality is there are artists like you and me all over the world finding their own way to do this every single day. Some of them are doing ninja access. Some of them are doing a trust all access. So everyone is on this journey together. Um, and again, our goal is all the same. So, you know, don't get discouraged when you first start and go down this path. It is a learning process. And then the last case that I want to show you is this one. Um, this is tooth number 13. And we, you know, we started this discussion with the Mona Lisa. And for me, this particular case actually represents my Mona Lisa. And the reason that I would say this is if you look at number 13, we've got a tooth that has, you know, moderate calcification present. We have some pretty acute apical curvature. Um, this is a tooth where after my initial access, rotary files were only introduced into the coronal to mid third of that root. So I never achieved working length. I never achieved patency. Nothing has ever violated the apical portion of that tooth. And yet, because we're using the gentle wave system and allowing it to work in our favor, again, to help us achieve the goal that we all set out to do, and that's preserve teeth, then we can do it in a really natural way and capture that beauty of what nature actually gave us to begin with without destroying it. And this is hard to achieve. You know, I yearn for a day when we can do this predictably. Um, maybe when a file barely, you know, goes into the tooth or barely penetrates the space, and yet consistently we can capture anatomy like that. Uh, I don't think we're there yet, but hopefully one day we will be. Um, and in the meantime, you know, I want to leave you guys with this quote. Uh, da Vinci said that simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. So as you're beginning this journey, as you're going down this path of utilizing gentle wave, what I hope that we're all striving for is simplicity and elegance and excellence in our quest to preserve and capture the true natural form of the teeth and provide the best outcomes for our patients. 
And with that, I'll say thank you. If you have any questions, I would certainly love to hear from you. Um, don't hesitate. You can reach out to me via email or find me on Instagram. And again, I thank everyone for joining us today.